Um, so I'm sure that many of you are familiar with Wiley Coyote and Roadrunner, or <laughs> Captain Ahab and Moby Dick. Um, you know, these iconic rivals in pop culture and literature. You probably don't know about a third, <laughs> um, and that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight. And that's the rivalry that my father had with our family dog. <laughs> and, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about this. So, in 1978, my father decided to get my mom a black dog to retrieve her. And so, she, she was crazy about dogs, loved them. My dad, for his part, was indifferent, maybe disdainful, of animals, <laughs> but he got her the dog, um, the puppy. And, you know, I was one of, I have one of four children, and we were all ecstatic, ecstatic about this dog. But, Strangely enough, according to my mom, veterinarians in the 1970s actually believed that not neutering a dog would make it less likely to run away. Which makes no sense. It makes no sense. I'm not a vet. Um, it strikes me as weird that my parents were both physicians and neither one questioned the logic of the vet. But there was. So we had an unfixed puppy, black lavender retriever. Now, I grew up in the suburb of Chicago. We had five acres uh, of woods behind us, and those woods were hemmed in by a patchwork of a fence. It was like an idea of a fence. <laughs> um, so <laughs> that's where we were with the puppy. So, um, <laughs> so my father had initially, you know, kind of three basic sets of, like, three kind of relationships with Charlie. And by the way, he was named Charlie because my mom's pet name for us, for all the children, was Charlie Brown, so she wanted to name him Charlie. So, Charlie it was. I, for my part, wanted to name him Crystal, Frosty the Snowman's girlfriend. <laughs> not Frosty the Snowman, but again, the dog was a black lab. Like, <laughs> my mom shot that down, thankfully. So, but my dad had like these three primary reactions to the dog. The first, he, he wanted to train the dog, um, which was great because he tended to repeat himself, like any of my students would say, I do too. Not a great sound, not a great trait, but whatever. So he repeated himself a lot. And he was also really organized. So he was adamant about being consistent with the rules for the dog, which included like, go to the woods, which meant don't shit on the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> like we'd be eating dinner and the dog would be there. He's like, you know, no bagging, no bagging. Or if the dog, you know, when we, we had like a whole routine for him when he had dinner, <laughs> it would sit, stay, Eat, and you had to kind of enunciate the eat. So this is dad, okay, so he's all about training the dog. But the second thing he was really into with Charlie was blaming him. So we feel like in my living room, watching Nova, or whatever you watch, and all of a sudden, you know, there would just be this cloud. You know, clearly someone had passed out. Someone in the room. There six people and a dog in the room. Clearly my father is the one who just passed gas, but thank God the dog was right there with me. So he'd be like, oh, damn dog, Charlie, get him out of here. You know, I was like, you know, dad, nobody believes you. <laughs> and his third reaction to Charlie was really just kind of like coordinating Charlie's um, hair via signs and notes that he hung around the house. So he loved notes, he loved lists and always had a black Sharpie marker and scrap paper. But what he did is he combined his favorite things in the world, a Sharpie marker, scrap paper, and his two favorite um, ways of interacting with people. One, imperatives. The second, rhetorical questions. So, <laughs> on the back door of our house, which was the, the door by which my siblings and I left for school, or Whatever. My, my parents used a different door to get to the garage, so clearly his audience was, <laughs> was purposeful. There was a sign that hung that just said, ask yourself, Colin, does the puppy have H2O? <laughs> and like two underlines <laughs> under H2O, um, which was like his own kind of like punctuation. So every time we left the house, we were reminded to check for the water. Did he have a show? Well, yeah, he did, because we were always being reminded. So everything was pretty amicable. My father had a fairly unromantic and indifferent relationship to Charlie. 
until Charlie started to come of age. And an unfixed Labrador Retriever, I dare you, I dare you to stop it. <laughs> so Charlie, I mean, I mean uh, good work, you know, go, sow your seeds. Um, but my dad was not a big fan of this. <laughs> um, you know, he was driving like 90 minutes to and from work you know, on the Eisenhower Expressway to Chicago, which you've ever, if you've ever been on, I, I'm so sorry, and I have some value in my first train. It's kind of a belated way for you to relax, just kidding, you don't have um, <laughs> but, but, so my dad is like on the highway, back and forth every day, so the last words you want to hear when you come home as an adult with four kids, both you and your wife are working, is, Dad, the dog got out again, okay? So he, this commenced insanity. So. Here is where the rivalry between my father and Charlie crystallized. Charlie, when he ran away, it wasn't like he was gone for an hour, or two hours, or even one day. Like, when he ran away, he ran away. One day, two days, three days, four days. I mean, I lived in a constant state of either panic and anxiety or relief when he was found. There was my adrenal system is still recovering. It was that's, that was reality in the house. So when he ran away, it was in the you know 1980s. This is like pre-global warming, which meant that winters were winters, which meant that it wasn't 60 out. It was like minus 40. And so Charlie's out. We don't know where. We get a call. He's like five miles away on someone's lawn. Um, or like one time we got a phone call from a family in Highwood a really Italian community close to where I grew up. And when my dad went to go pick up the dog, he's eating a bowl of spaghetti. <laughs> so no wonder the dog is running away. <laughs> um, so it was just a really um, intense moment for my dad because all of a sudden there was a task. And the task was to stop him from running away, which meant that we had to find the hole in the fence. Five acres. <laughs> 100-year-old house, patchwork fence, okay. So my father invented something called posting. Um, and what this entailed was sitting in our sun porch at this glass table, and he would implore us to invite our friends and neighbors over after mass at Holy Cross on Sundays. So John, Bill, Joanne, and I, so my siblings and I, would all invite neighborhood friends. So there'd be eight to 10 of us in this table, okay? Ranging in age from eight to 14. And we were there dutifully listening to my father, you know, dispense military operation-like <laughs> procedures for posting. So what's posting? Well, posting is when you sit in a tree along the perimeter of the fence, and what you do is you wait. You just wait. You sit in a tree, and you wait for the dog to get out somewhere near you. <laughs> so you can tell your father, I found the hole. Now, this is predicated on one important um, piece of misinformation, which is that a dog is like a human coming and going from one exit. I mean, the dog is just trying to mate. He's going to dig, he's going to jump, he's going to go anywhere. There's not one hole, but whatever. So my father would sit us all down, and he had a piece of paper, and he would draw in his black Sharpie marker the perimeter of the fence. And he would assign us our posts. I was always with my best friend, Amy Hurry, and we were always by the turkey house. My brothers were scattered by the no socks, by the Johnsons, by the barn, whatever. But we all had our posts. So what he would do is he would say to us, I'm going to let the D-O-G <laughs> O-U-T. <laughs> my dad, why are you spelling things? It's like, because the dog is listening. Why am I spelling things? Because the dog's listening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so this is the nature of the Bible, you know. So anyhow, so after he had assigned us our posts, came the time where he let Charlie out. So he would give us 10 minutes to establish our posts, Young children climbing old trees. It's this, I mean, there have been young adult tragic novels written about it. Um, so we're climbing trees, 
um, sitting silently, amped up, so amped up, we're like ready to, to find a hole. And my dad lets Charlie out, and he just sits there. <laughs> you know why? Because much like the misinformation around not neutering a dog will not make them run away, Charlie was a hunting dog. He, is, he smells eight to ten humans in the yard. Okay. Do you think he's going to go? He's not going to go anywhere. I mean, that's, it's ridiculous. So he would just sit there. But I hear my dad, you know, go to the woods, Charlie. Go to the woods. Just clapping with a disembodied voice, like coming to us by the turkey house. So until one day, one day, I don't know, Charlie must have been in a bad way. Because he got out with ten kids posting in the woods. And so all of a sudden, we're there, you know, we're trying to be silent, we're doing our job, dutiful daughters, dutiful sons, dutiful neighbors, whatever. And all of a sudden I hear, David, he's coming toward you. So David Neal, my brother's best friend, who was perched by the docents. So apparently Charlie darted that way. And the next thing I hear is David saying, there he goes. <laughs> so it's one job, because it's one job to find, like, Charlie just escaped under your nose, and you're gonna go tell my father that you didn't see where. I wish you so much luck. <laughs> I wish you a lot of luck. So my father brings us all in, and he's basically, it's like the Inquisition on poor David Neal. He's 13. He's 13 years old, and he's trying to say to my dad, I don't know, like, I, I'm sorry, I don't know where he went. My dad's response, oh, I understand. Yeah. He put on a cape. He flew over the <laughs> Okay. Yeah, no, I understand. That's what happened. No one saw him. No one saw the dog? No one saw the dog. Okay. So if you want to know what defeat looks like, imagine the dog on the opposite side of the fence wagging its tail like a middle finger. <laughs> After you just deployed half the neighborhood and your kids in an all-day posting session. So finally, years later, when Charlie died, we had him cremated. I don't know if that's common for animals to be cremated, but we love this dog very much. My mom was adamant that we cremate him. And we buried his ashes under the statue of St. Francis in our yard on this side of the fence. <laughs>